to discussions if I can. Thank you. Later this afternoon, tonight, I encourage you to continue having these discussions because I want to restate for about the tenth time, culture trumps strategy. Once, you, once you've determined what it is that we got to change, the next big question becomes, okay, what do we need to change? What do we need to change? And there are two or three things that appear to be far more important than others in terms of what we need to change, and those are what have really defined the Common Core State Standards. Um, and one of them happens to be literacy. The other is the application of knowledge. The third is higher expectations. So let me begin with the reading. Is reading important? I asked for a second time. Yes or no? A little or a lot? And want to do a good job in teaching reading, you teach reading in the content area. Underpinning the Common Core State Standards, there was a study done of 75 school districts in America. All together class, how many school districts? All together how many? 75. And they looked at 11th and 12th grade English language arts. Do we have anybody in the room who ever taught 11th and 12th grade English language arts by a show of hands? Okay, they simply went into these 75 communities, at least one in every state in the country. And they said, give us everything kids have to read in 11th and 12th grade English language arts. 11th and 12th grade English language arts. Do you all know what the Lexal framework is? How many know, not in detail, but the concept of the Lexile framework? Okay, good. 2,000 point scale for reading. What they did is they went into 75 high schools, took everything kids had to read in 11th and 12th grade English language arts, and they Lexiled it. Now, I don't want to get too technical, but see the top, it says interquartile range. They threw out the bottom 25% of the materials and they threw out the top 25%, they took the middle 50%, and that's where it fell. It really doesn't tell you a whole lot except an opening reference point. Then they followed the kids to college. Didn't matter where they went, community college, state university, liberal arts college, and looked at their freshman and sophomore English lit classrooms, and that's where they fell. And so what it shows you is the kid in college reads at a little bit higher level than the kid in high school, which is not surprising. Third column was our first gee whiz moment. What column was the first column? What discipline was the first column? Remind me, class, what was it? English language arts. Third column, every other 11th and 12th grade classroom, same 75 high schools, and this is where it fell. In every high school we've looked at in America, the English language arts departments have the lowest reading requirements of any disciplines in American schools. And you know who didn't know that? English language arts people. You know who else didn't know it? No one knew it. What discipline do you think had the highest reading requirements? Every, uh, every school we looked at, what discipline has the highest reading requirements? Science. I thought it was going to be science. Science actually ended up being second. Guess again. Math is third. Social studies is second from the bottom. English language arts is the bottom. What's number one? Career and tech ed. In 2013. You know why? They got to read a manual. And how many of you since the last Sunday in October, uh, in April, have had your car clock off by one hour? <laughs> Got the manuals, can't you read? Are not part of our definition of literacy. Ladies and gentlemen, Career and Tech Ed, they gotta read a manual today. You want, you want an auto technician putting brakes on your car who can't read a manual? You want an electrician wiring your house who can't read a manual. Ladies and gentlemen, career and tech ed had the highest reading requirements. Who are you putting in the career and tech ed programs? All the kids who can't read. Let me keep going. Followed the kids to college, freshman, sophomore year, other than English lit, that's where it fell. Followed them to the military, I already gave you Condi uh, Rice's information. Military is very high. 
but it's very prescriptive, so the bar isn't very long. That's where it falls. We ask 100 parents in each of 75 communities of teenagers, 7,500 parents of teenagers nationwide. Tell us what you think the kids have got to read in order to become independent. Remember, you wanted all your kids to be independent? What did they give us? Contracts, insurance information, loan applications, materials to get jobs. Where did it fall? Right there. Went to the 10 largest employers in each of the communities, 750 employers nationwide, said give us what you want entry level workers to read. What level worker? And that's where it fell. Why? They got to read manuals. Ladies and gentlemen, please compare the last three columns to the first column. Finally, SATs, ACTs, and advanced placement. Lower than entry level jobs. Lower than the military. Lower than personal use. Why do the Common Core State Standards say college and career? Because the academic skills, the academic skills in literacy are higher than they are in higher education. In math, they're not higher. They are different. So let me take you there. Uh, I want everybody in the room to read these. And in a moment, I want you to yell out your personal opinion. What two numbers on this chart will the students need to be able to function at in order to become independent? Is it level one and two, or is it level four and five? Got my question? Don't be quiet, yell it out. Not partly, yell it out. What two numbers do they need to become independent? Yell your answer now. Four. Sounds like you all agree. Must be common sense. Let me take you deeper. We've done under contract a detailed analysis of every state testing program in America, including Kentucky's. What two numbers on this chart is nearly every question on every test in every discipline? We just defined the problem. We got an eye on the wrong ball. The world requires four and five, and we're stuck at one and two. Now, there's nothing wrong with one and two, but I can do one and two and not be able to do four and five. One and two is essential, so that I'm not misquoted. One and two is what? But it's not adequate. Let me take you deeper. Everybody recognize this? Whose taxonomy is it, folks? Bloom's. This is the framework of the new Common Core State Standards, but more importantly, this is the framework of the new Parks and Smarter Test. This is the framework your new test is being built on. If you remember nothing else from this afternoon, remember this framework. They put blooms up the left-hand side or academic rigor. They put application across the bottom. They break it into four quadrants. A is low-level knowledge with no application. B is low level knowledge with a lot of real world application. C, very sophisticated knowledge, often with little if any relevance. D, D is rigor and relevance. Here are four ninth grade math standards out of your existing state standards. I'm gonna have you in a couple minutes uh, just in a minute, raise your hand if you feel you can do these. And then I'm going to pick out somebody who can do them and bring them up front and let them try to demonstrate ninth grade math in front of the rest of the group. If you don't raise your hands, that means you can't do ninth grade math. I can't do it. I could have done it when I was in ninth grade, but it's been a long time since ninth grade. See if you can complete the statement. If you don't use it, how many would join me in having a hard time doing it? Or how many could do these? Show of hands. Or probably only somebody's a math teacher. Nobody in the room, like one person, two people, three. And were you a math teacher? Well, let's try these four. 
And tell me in a moment whether you think these four are easier than the previous four. By a show of hands, how many find these four easier than the previous four? Ladies and gentlemen, anybody in the room who has a math background noticed anything about the two sets of standards? They're the same. They're the same. The first four is how they exist in our traditional math curriculum, math in isolation. These are anchored to real world everyday applications. After millions of dollars of research, what did we find? One simple concept. Relevance makes rigor possible. But we also found that what's relevant to one child is not next to relevant to the next. And that's where the third R comes in of relationships. Ladies and gentlemen, they are your existing standards. That is the common core state standards. They're application based. But the real challenge is application doesn't occur one discipline at a time. And we have an organizational problem in our schools. Right now, what we know is you got to get the D. They're the D level skills. See, A and C is knowledge. Kids can access knowledge by Google, but they can't make good judgments about whether the data is accurate or not. They don't know how to apply it in the B and D quadrant. A is your present state test. B is career and tech ed, real world application of basics. C, very sophisticated knowledge, often with little, if any, relevance. D. D is rigor and relevance. D is the common core state standards, more importantly, the new assessment. They measure these types of skills. By the way, they are precisely the set of skills business and industry is looking for. You got those skills, you're employable. To drive it home, let me play a little video and I want you to tell me whether it possibly could be true. Could it be true? Ladies and gentlemen, you got to get them to the B and D quadrant. That's what the new assessments are about. That's what the new standards are about. 
The challenge is that's not how we're organized. We're organized by disciplines. We're organized by a hundred year old curriculum structure that most of the rest of the world in the last decade has abandoned. But we are regulated, certified, tenured, contracted, physical plants built, teachers trained for the 20th century system. You gonna change the schools? You know what we figured out? Change the test. And when those tests change, the implication, well, let me show you. Again, these are your present test. That's CTE. That's college ready. That is career ready. Ladies and gentlemen, this is all the states in America depicted by NAEP. Percentage of kids proficient based upon what each state has defined as their definition of proficiency. Every state in the country has had their own testing program. And so one of the pushes for the Common Core and Next Generation was to get some uniformity so for college mission, for the workplace, we could begin to compare Tennessee students to Kentucky students, to Texas students, to Massachusetts students. When you begin to do that, this is the cut point used by every state in the country to define proficiency in fourth grade. Okay? And the only way you can tell is by NAEP, National Assessment of Educational Progress. Tennessee has the lowest definition of proficiency of any state in America. Massachusetts has the highest. Massachusetts is the only state on the entire list that used the research I just showed you to define proficiency. They actually went to the workplace and to higher ed and said, what do you need for college admission? But more importantly, they found the workplace had a higher threshold, so they set it at what you need to obtain and maintain entry-level employment. That is Kentucky you have dramatically higher standards than Tennessee, but much lower than Massachusetts. The debate going on, Sue Gendron, my senior vice president, the senior policy director of the new assessments. Here is the debate. How do you do set proficiency? Do we set proficiency on the new test based upon what we think the kids will be able to pass, or do we set proficiency based upon what they will need to be independent, to get a job. And the pushback from political leaders and business leaders, where do you think all of them are coming from? What you need to be independent. Ladies and gentlemen, there's no way we're gonna be able to set that proficiency level lower than this. What does that mean? In two years, with the new assessments, you're gonna have a dramatic increase in failure rates. Not only you, nothing in comparison to what Tennessee's gonna have. But do the parents know that? Have you told your boards yet? Do the teachers know it? Oh, by, this, by the way, same time the new teacher evaluation program comes in. Oh. So maybe, just maybe, if you're a teacher and you understand this data and why we gotta do it, maybe they will embrace the need to have a professional development program to teach me how to teach reading as a math teacher. You gotta create the culture. Here's eighth grade reading. Texas has the lowest cut point in the nation. Missouri has the highest. This is Kentucky. Here's fourth grade math. You can read the numbers. Here's eighth grade math. And the difference in math, unlike reading, is in math, the questions are all application based. And you have a real challenge because your math curriculum and your math teachers have not been taught to teach math with, from an application perspective. We have taught it more as mathematicians. And so folks, how do you define proficiency? It's going to be defined by what the research says kids need to be independent. It means our failure rate in the short term is going to increase. 
you need to have a public awareness program for everybody to understand. Doesn't mean our school is getting worse. It means that we've gone to a new higher standard. Uh, how do you do it? Well, you can't change it all. Uh, you can't change it one classroom at a time. You got to change it throughout the entire system. You have to have an unrelenting commitment system wide. When we watch the highest performing schools, and what I'm going to give you next, I could spend two days on. I'll spend five minutes. We went into these nation's most rapidly improving schools. We went to their board meetings, and I want you to ponder this. Where are the superintendents in the room? We found that on average, they were spending at least 70, and many of them, 80% of the total time in board meetings talking about student achievement. That's what the board talks about. Is that what your boards are talking about? Or are they talking about adult issues? If the board spends their time on it, guess what the executive staff at the superintendent meetings talk about? Student achievement. What do the faculty meetings talk about? Same thing. And if you're going to talk, begin to talk about student achievement, like I have for the last several minutes, you begin to talk about effective instruction. Okay, how do I move the needle? How do I begin to do it? And if you're going to move the needle, you got to do some things differently at the teaching level, but also at the instructional leadership level. That's where you begin to see that they start to talk about things like looping. Remember earlier? In interdisciplinary department chairs. They talk about the organizational leadership. What are we going to do? How do we have parents understand this? How do we have the kids understand the consequence of why we need higher standards? Ladies and gentlemen, they have a systems approach, and then they target professional development to address it. And they talk about building those skills. They talk about things like executive coaching, helping staff see how to do it. Forgive me. Most middle school and high school teachers liked the discipline they're now teaching when they were a student in high school. They liked it so much they went to college and majored in it. They not only majored in it, they took their elective courses in it. So that when they graduated from college, they could return to a middle school or a high school in the state of Kentucky to do to others what had been done to them. And then what does the administration do? Takes all the teachers who think exactly alike, different than the whole rest of the world, but alike as a little group, and puts them in a department together. It almost sounds incestuous. So why do we find 47 of the 50 nation's most rapidly improving schools eliminated department chair people? It's an organizational issue. They're the gatekeepers to the past. To help them through that, you need some executive coaching. Greg and other groups, that's what they're there to try to help you with. Figure out how to change the system because you're going to have people who are going to fight to maintain the system unless you create a culture that will support change. And I know I'm terribly repetitive on that message. Culture trumps strategy. I am not convinced that the rank and file in most of your schools are ready to support change. And you know what you're confusing? Obedient staff with motivated staff. Obedient are the ones who will just do it because you told them to do it. Motivated are the groups saying, we got to do it differently. And then you got to give them tools. Math. Let me give you a math one. In math, what we found is it's B and B. Kids have to know how to apply knowledge in a real world work environment. Look at your math curriculum. It is not historically designed that way. Why did when Joseph Goins from Win Learning said, would you come and speak to this group? I said yes. And they sponsored me. Why? Because I have great respect for what they're trying to do with that math curriculum. What they have done is develop high quality, cutting edge instructional materials to help a teacher figure out how to move beyond the theoretical delivery of instruction into application-based instruction that is of interest to the kids. 
But I said earlier, what's of interest to one child is not of interest to the next, and therefore the traditional textbook doesn't work. They gotta be able to go into the system, pull out example, pull out areas they're interested in, take the math concept and have to apply it to teach B and D. Once you, they learn how to apply it, performance goes through the ceiling. Other areas, I'm gonna give you a, one more, and there's an announcement of it in the back room. I call it Nexpert. Uh, there's a group called the Successful Practices Network, a 501c3. That was the group that did the original research with the Gates Foundation, uh, paid for by the Gates Foundation with CCSSO on the nation's most rapidly improving schools. And what we de determined very quickly is once you get the teachers who are willing to change, and I suggest to you you're not going to get 100%. That bottom third isn't going to be willing until you stand on your head and spit nickels. The top two thirds, when you get them willing to change, you've got to give them tools and strategies that will enable them to do it. It's not that they are opposed. They were never taught how. So yes, it's materials like to win learning, but the other thing you've got to give them is you've got to give them some help to figure out what to take off the plate. Folks, you just got too many standards in your state. It's that simple. You get too many standards. The standard setting process state by state became a political driven process. And everybody who had an interest was invited to the table and everybody brought their list. And that list got longer and longer and longer and were killing the teachers and the kids. High performing schools said let's take a bunch of stuff off the plate. Let me give you a way to do that. It's called Next Network or Nextpert. It's a five column uh, database. It's over 20,000 pages long. In the back of the room you can pick up information on it. Or in the bottom of the yellow sheet there on, on the right, there's something that says Next Network. You can check it there and I'll send information to you. But what they simply have done is state by state taking the standards and compared them to the state test. Now this is your existing ones. High are the standards of subdomains that are on the test. We put medium if we can't figure out what they are. Your test, you have a very clean blueprint in your state for your test. It's easy to determine. Low are the number of standards uh, or subdomains that are not tested. Ladies and gentlemen, you don't test most of this stuff. I got a question, do your teachers know that? And so what do we have in most states? We got the teachers on a treadmill saying, I gotta cover everything because it might be on the test using nothing other than that data, we saw schools go from the bottom 10% of their state up to the top 50%. Now I wanna be crystal clear, I don't know that those schools are any better schools. They're only better at one thing. What are they better at, folks? The test. But you know what? I'm sorry, it's a politically driven system. Until you're good at the test, you're not gonna be permitted to do anything. Once you're good at the test, you know what you then can do? Anything you choose to. So, we simply took that data. How do you, you go in, plug in the standard you're teaching or subdomain, it will tell you the status on the state test. Your state test presently, as in most every state in the country, test in the A quadrant. But we don't want you to teach simply to the test, so we added a third column. And the third column is all the national research, which by the way happened to be the research to underpin the Common Core because the Common Core state standards are fewer in number, but higher in number. They're more rigorous, but there are fewer of them. How did they get to the fewer? By hard research data. And so for example, it's called National Essential Skills Study. Language Arts, here's a standard. Write clear and concise directions or procedures. They run across the country, surveyed various groups, business community, other non-educators, parents, general public, English teachers, other educators, and here's one of the standards, right? Clear and concise directions or procedures. Overall, out of 50 standards, that was the ninth highest language arts standard in the country. Uh, the business community ranked it second. Other non-educators, parents, general public ranked it 10th, almost the same as the overall ranking. Look where the English teachers rank that thing, 25th. Other educators, meaning 
All the teachers other than English teachers ranked the eighth, almost the same as the overall ranking. School administrators in the audience, who do you have making instructional decisions in your schools? All the people who see the issue differently than everybody else? Who I say again, liked the discipline when they were in school. Went to college to major in it. Took elective courses in it. Graduated from college, went back to school, and you put them in departments together. Ladies and gentlemen, you got the wrong people making the decisions. <laughs> You got people who are going to drive you back every time to the 20th century. It's what they know, it's what they value. And they should be consulted, but they shouldn't be the ultimate decision maker. That was the conclusion of the Common Core State Standards Commission. Let me give you another one. Give clear and concise directions or procedures. Give clear and concise directions, uh, oral directions or uh, and procedures. Look at where the English teachers rank it in comparison to everybody else. So what aren't they teaching? That's what kids need the most. Who in the room has a background in mathematics? Hands way up. Let me show you why nobody ever wants to have lunch with any of you. <laughs> Let me show you what's exciting to the math people. Fourth most exciting thing we could do is apply the Pythagorean theorem to a right triangle. Look where they rank that sucker in comparison to everybody else. Where do they rank as really, really low and everybody else ranks as high? Anything to do with the application of basic mathematics, B and D on the rigor and relevance framework. And so the database, and I already gave you the reading research. This database, column one, simply gives you the state standard. Column two, tells you the standard, uh, the status of the standard on the test. Column three tells you what does all the national research say about it. If you have a standard that is no in column two and no in column three, why in the world would you be teaching it? Your state, your state data. Depending on the grade and the discipline, it runs 30 to 40 percent of the standards are no in both column two and three. Get rid of it and then teach the remaining 60 to 70 percent to the B and D quadrant. Problem is teachers don't know how to teach in the B and D quadrant. They need good materials, lessons, activities. I'll show you in a moment how to get it. If you do this for the next year, you're going to be in pretty good shape because the third column is the fourth column. And these all spin away after the end of the year. But you need more than that. What else do you need? You need to give the teachers some test questions. I'm going to ask you to go to your folder that George's staff provided you on the way in. And in that folder, there's something that says at the top, International Center uh, Leadership and Education. And there's a test question there. And on the Flip side of it, if you flip that page right over, there's a, another question with a picture in the middle. Everybody see it? How many have ever heard of the two second rule by a show of hands? In, in driving, you're supposed to have two seconds between you and the car in front of you, am I right? Okay, this is the two second rule. Read the question, answer it. 